electric, gas, water, sewer, telephone, cable TV. Just about every road and street in the country has utility installations nearby. Overhead, on the surface, underground. The relationship between roadways and utilities isn't accidental. In fact, state and local laws require that public and private utilities be accommodated on highway and street rights of way. Because utilities are so closely connected with roads, any work involving the installation of new facilities or the repair or adjustment of existing ones naturally affects the roadways, especially when it occurs beneath the pavement. Local highway agencies, of course, would prefer to minimize utility cuts in their roads and streets. You can't blame them for not wanting to see the pavements and roadbeds cut into and the local traffic disrupted. But that's what's required if we want to see our utility services maintained and improved. This two-part presentation from the Local Technical Assistance Program, LTAP, focuses on utility cuts in paved roads making them effectively and safely, with as little disruption of travel and commerce as possible, and without leaving behind a defective roadway. To achieve this, there's need for a partnership among all interested parties, government agencies, utility companies, contractors, and the public. Now, the problem with utility cuts, as viewed by the experts, is twofold. The first part of the problem is poor methods of making and restoring utility cuts. For example, poor quality backfill materials and improper placement and compaction procedures can lead to subgrade settlement. Another example, shoddy pavement repair produces a ragged, bumpy road surface. The result of poor work methods is a rougher ride for motorists and, perhaps, damage to vehicles, more frequent accidents, greater road maintenance costs, and maybe even shortened pavement life. The second part of the problem is poor management of utility cuts, including deficient communication and coordination between utility and agency, problems in locating, marking, and avoiding incidents with existing utility facilities. faulty work planning and scheduling, and inadequate traffic control. To address these problems, we'll look at ways for local agencies to improve utility cut work methods and management. We'll focus first on utility coordination and control, then locating existing utilities, traffic control, pavement cutting, excavation, backfilling, surface restoration, and site cleanup. The coordination and control of utility cuts is affected by who performs the work. In the simplest, most direct cases, a local public works agency is in charge of both the street maintenance and the utility service. Coordination and control in such cases ought to be clear-cut, easy, and effective, an internal matter within a single organization. More often, however, the coordination must take place between the government agency and a private or public utility company. But still the question can be asked, who performs the work? Utility companies can do it all, including patching the pavement after the utility work is completed. Or they can contract the patching to a company more specialized in pavement work. Yet another scenario is for the government agency to perform the repairs with either its own forces or a contractor that it hires and then build the utilities for the work. In all cases, nevertheless, the government agency retains the ultimate responsibility. Regardless of who actually does the work, local agencies can use several means to ensure that utility cuts are properly made and restored. First, a permit process makes it clear who is in charge of the local roads and streets. 
Permit information tells an agency who will cut into a road or street, for what reason, at what location, when the opening will be made, and how long the surface will be open. The permit form itself may be simple or comprehensive, depending on the agency's structure. Permits may stipulate requirements for work methods and materials, work hours, safety measures, and other issues. They bind the utility to comply with conditions that the agency deems important. The agency may charge anywhere from no fee at all to one of several hundred dollars to cover as little as handling costs only or as much as inspection services and restoration work that it may provide. Another means for ensuring that utility cuts are properly made is a performance or surety bond required of utilities by the local agency. The bond's value should be enough to cover the cost for the government to complete or correct the work if the utility's performance is deficient or incomplete. Agencies may hold such bonds for one to three years or require utilities to maintain standing bonds so that one is not needed for each new cut. Agencies should furthermore require that the utility have comprehensive public liability and property damage insurance, naming the agency as additional insured. Finally, Another way of ensuring that utilities make utility cuts properly is through specifications, ones that guide both the utility's work and the agency's inspection of it. In particular, the specifications should emphasize work quality, promptness of performance, safety measures for workers, motorists, and pedestrians, the appearance of the completed patch, the smoothness of the patched surface, the endurance of the patch, and penalties for non-compliance. Another means used by some agencies is a one-year maintenance agreement or warranty. Typically, these stipulate the circumstances under which corrective work is needed and indicate who should do it. Utility identification markings are a good idea. The agency should have each utility paint its company ID in the proper color code on the curb or pavement next to the patch and maintain it there for one year. This way, the agency will know who is responsible for any settlement or failure. Inspection of utility cut work and the restored pavement surface can assure the agency that the specifications are complied with. Still, the agency's policies and procedures should make it clear that inspections in no way relieve the utility owner of responsibility to the general public or of liability for loss, damage, or injury to persons or property. Finally, communication is indispensable in ensuring that utilities perform their work properly. Besides covering standard procedures and written specifications, codes, and policies, agencies should establish procedures for handling emergencies who to contact in what cases and how to do so. In addition, local utility coordinating committees should be formed by utility and agency personnel so that they can get acquainted with each other, discuss plans and problems, and coordinate activities during regularly scheduled meetings. Now, locating existing utilities. Most states have laws requiring anyone who intends to excavate to first find out what underground utility facilities are in the area where digging will be done. These need to be located as accurately as possible and temporarily marked on the surface as a guide to the excavator. Such precautions are aimed not only at safeguarding the underground facilities, but also at protecting workers and anyone else in the vicinity. Good morning, this is Miss Utila. The all lines are being recorded. My name is Joanne. May I help you? Nearly all states have one call yes. systems in place to serve all parties interested yes. in knowing what's in the ground. Basically, one phone call can initiate a process in which the underground facilities at an excavation site are identified, located, and marked. Information on other utility locating systems can be obtained from your technology transfer center. Individual utility companies or specialized locating services 
then consult plans or other records for the specified locale. Alignments and depths shown there, however, are often approximate. So, in the field, the locator uses sophisticated equipment to find all buried facilities and mark on the surface their locations, any changes of direction, widths, if more than 50 millimeters, and endpoints. To increase visibility, temporary survey stakes or flags should be placed to supplement the surface marks. All temporary markings or markers should indicate the name, initials, or logo of the company that owns or operates the facility. A uniform color code has been developed by the Utility Location and Coordination Council of the American Public Works Association to mark various categories of utilities. This pocket card from APWA contains guidelines for uniform temporary marking of underground facilities, including the uniform color code. Red for electric power lines, cables, conduit, and lighting cables. Yellow for gas, oil, steam, petroleum, or gaseous materials. Orange for communication, alarm, or signal lines, cables, or conduit. Blue for water, irrigation, and slurry lines. And green for sewers and drain lines. Where several facilities lie close together, using the color code makes markings distinguishable and understandable to all. All utility work, whether done in the roadway or on the roadside, calls for serious attention to traffic control. Pavement openings, of course, involve lane closures. Most roads or streets cannot be entirely closed to traffic. So even when full width crossings must be made, they're done incrementally to allow one or more lanes to remain open for traffic. The key references to traffic control procedures and devices are, first of all, the MUTCD, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. It's the nationwide standard. Second, the local government agency may have additional policies or procedures that must be complied with. If so, utilities and contractors should get familiar with them and integrate them into their practices. In addition, pocket guides such as this one, based on the MUTCD's requirements, show how to apply traffic controls in various typical locations and situations. The traffic control for each utility cut must be well thought out and set up before any work begins. The planning should be done in terms of a work zone, not merely a work site. A whole work zone consists of different areas, each with its own purpose and requirements. First comes the advanced warning area, designed to tell traffic what to expect ahead, the type of work, its location relative to the road, the need to change lanes, the presence of one or more flaggers. The transition area follows the advanced warning area and precedes the work area. In this case, a one-lane closure on a low-volume street. The purpose of a transition area is to move traffic out of its normal path. In higher speed work zones, a buffer area often comes next. It's intended to provide protection for both traffic and workers. Then comes the work area itself, bordered by channelizing devices. Finally, a termination area lets traffic resume normal driving. Traffic signs and other devices should be the appropriate types, sizes, and colors for the work. In reasonably good condition, set up in the correct locations, and spaced properly. Signs used at night must be retro-reflective or be lighted. To be effective, signs and devices must be maintained in place and in good condition. They need to be checked frequently to see if they've been knocked down or otherwise moved out of position. If so, they should be put back promptly. 
Any that have lost their visibility should be cleaned up or replaced. When a sign's message no longer applies, it's important to cover it or remove it from view. This is a common shortcoming with utility work. For example, a utility work ahead sign left in place after the work is done. Or a flagger ahead sign when no flagger is to be found. You only have to fool motorists a couple of times before they start ignoring the warning signs. And speaking of flaggers, when one or more are needed, they should be properly attired and equipped and use standard flagging procedures to direct motorists. Temporary control measures may be needed to reduce traffic disruption. For example, steel plates can be used to open lanes to traffic even before trenches are backfilled and pavements are repaired. Steel plates that lie flat, having all edges and corners in contact with the underlying pavement, tend to stay put by themselves. After all, they are rather heavy. But often, steel plates are a little warped, or the pavement surface beneath them is irregular. Typically, you see and hear some rocking. Not only does this tend to startle motorists and give them an uneasy feeling, but the constant noise can really get on the nerves of nearby residents. Furthermore, rocking plates tend to migrate due to the action of tires. Enough movement and they run the risk of no longer bridging the utility cut completely. To avoid this, some local agencies require that steel plates be fastened to the pavements to keep them from drifting. One anchoring method is to drive pins into the pavement through pre-cut holes in the plates. While another is to drive pins around plate edges. Some agencies place asphalt mix around plate edges in an attempt to secure the plates. But this rarely works when there's severe rocking. A better purpose for this mix is to form ramps to lessen the bumps created by plates. Be sure though that not too much mix is placed around the edges or else worse bumps will be formed. On some streets or roads, the average daily traffic may require same-day patches, one lane at a time. In other cases, the work may only be done on certain days or within certain hours, including, sometimes, restrictions that utility cuts be made only during nighttime hours, all in the cause of reducing traffic disruptions. This is the end of part one of Utility Cuts in Paved Roads. Take a break before continuing with part two. In this second part of Utility Cuts in Paved Roads, we'll continue looking at ways for local government agencies to improve utility cut work methods and management, beginning with pavement cutting. First, it's important to re-emphasize safe work zones. All traffic control devices, flaggers, and the work zone as a whole should be checked often for compliance with the minimum requirements of the MUTCD and with all state and local regulations. When cutting pavements, care should always be taken to make neat, straight, vertical sided cuts, but especially when the sides of the cut will end up as the edges of a permanent patch. Many agencies instead make temporary patches initially and later replace them with permanent ones. In any case, utility cuts must be laid out properly in the correct location as previously marked, and to the proper dimensions. These proper dimensions must allow room for the utility facilities, workers and equipment, 
and the operations that will take place, including compaction of backfill. At least 460 millimeters of space should be allowed on each side of a facility. Of course, other factors may indicate that a wider cut is required, such as to accommodate a trench box or other type of shoring or bracing. In cutting asphalt pavements, the perimeter line should first be marked. White is the recommended marking color, so as not to be confused with any other utility markings in the area. Then a saw cut should be made along the lines, either full depth or partial depth. When partial depth, the sawing should cut to one-third the depth of the pavement, or at least 50 millimeters. Then a mechanical hammer should be used to cut the rest of the way down. The hammer should have a cutting edge of at least 100 millimeters. Alternatively, asphalt pavements may be cut with the mechanical hammer alone. However, in this case, the cuts should be squared before final repairs are made. The edges of all cuts should be vertical and straight. Hammer operators should be safely attired. Hard hat, safety goggles, ear protection, and sturdy steel-toed boots equipped with foot guards. When cutting concrete pavements, the outline of the cut should be sawed at least 200 millimeters beyond the edge of the trench at a depth of no more than 38 to 50 millimeters regardless of slab thickness. This saw cut will provide a straight, vertical face that will not spall. It's a good idea to make additional, less deep saw cuts parallel to the outline cut and a few millimeters away from it. These cuts provide a toehold for the hammer's breaker point and help to remove the concrete without spalling the adjacent pavement. Then a worker can begin breaking out the concrete below the saw cut with a mechanical hammer. This produces a rough face to place the concrete against when it's time to patch the cut. The existing pavement, a new patch, will tie together through aggregate interlock. Whatever the type of pavement, backhoe front end loaders are typically used to further break out the pavement and remove the debris from the trench area. Other types of equipment may also be used. Once the pavement has been cut through and the pieces are removed, the next step is excavation. A number of issues must be looked at here, all of them having some relationship to safety. First, it cannot be stressed too much. Locate all underground utilities in the area before starting to dig. In highly congested areas, consideration should be given to using non-destructive vacuum technologies to locate, uncover, and repair existing facilities. A little extra work up front can save time and money. Then, during excavation, crews must avoid contact with all utilities, above or below ground. In particular, Backhoe operators should never dig too close to the facilities they're uncovering. Instead, hand tools should be used when in close proximity. Crews should always be alert for unanticipated facilities too. Attention must also be paid to any surface encumbrances next to the trench. This means structures, trees, signs, or whatever else that might get in the way or fall in such as this curb and gutter section. They should be identified and then moved or supported. All warning systems should be checked for proper placement and functioning. Advanced signs, barricades and other devices around trenches. Backup alarms for heavy equipment. Not only workers and motorists need to be warned, but also pedestrians. Cave-ins are often a concern with utility trenches. Excavations deeper than 1.2 meters must always be shored or braced. Loose soils may require shoring at lesser excavation depths.
Typically, trench boxes are used in utility cuts. Spoil banks and equipment should be kept at least six tenths of a meter away from trenches to keep them from falling in. Proper access and egress for both workers and equipment is another issue. Trenches deeper than 1.2 meters must have exits, ladders, stairways, or ramps placed so that workers don't have to go more than seven and a half meters to reach one. Any danger to the workers from falling loads should be avoided. Workers should be kept away from loads during digging and operators should be protected too. Of course, hard hats are a must for everyone on the job. Hazardous atmospheres is a term that refers to unsafe air in trenches. Dust and smoke are harmful enough, but toxic, flammable, or asphyxiating gases can be deadly. A calibrated, direct reading instrument should be used to indicate when there's not enough oxygen in the trench, or when a volatile or toxic gas is present. When unsafe air is likely, emergency breathing equipment should be close at hand. A warning, however, Using such equipment requires properly trained personnel. Other emergency rescue equipment should be nearby too, according to OSHA regulations and agency or company policies. Other trenching issues include proximity to traffic, wet excavation, stability of adjacent structures, loose soil, fall protection, and finally, daily inspections to check all conditions. Not all of these issues arise with every utility cut, but as they do, each one should be considered and the necessary steps should be taken. New technologies and advances in existing ones promise to improve trenching operations or, in many cases, replace them altogether. For example, jacking and boring are trenchless methods of installing pipes beneath roadways. They have been in use for some time, but continue to be improved. Live insertion, small hole vacuum excavation technology, service terminations utilizing specially designed extension tools, pipe lining and pipe bursting are newer procedures for rehabilitating or replacing existing pipes. Such technologies should be considered as alternatives to conventional trenching when costs and other factors permit. Of course, the object of utility cuts or of trenchless methods is to install new utility facilities or repair or modify existing ones. That work, naturally, is the specialty of the utility company or contractor, and it's not our purpose to discuss it here. But once the installation, repair, modification, or whatever is done, inspected, and approved, it's time to cover it up and proceed to backfill the trench. Backfilling normally suggests putting back the material that was dug out of the trench, and generally that's the case. The fill material should match the subgrade of the rest of the roadway, if suitable. But sometimes certain subgrade materials are okay only as long as they're left undisturbed. Once excavated, their properties make them unsuitable for reuse as backfill. After all, there's quite an assortment of materials down there underlying our roads and streets, especially in older urban areas. Besides a variety of soils and natural and crushed stone and gravel, there may be large rocks, muck, cobblestones, bricks, railroad ties, and all sorts of debris. Such materials must not be included in the backfill, but must instead be discarded. Usable backfill includes granular materials, clay, sand, sand stabilized with cement, and non-shrink fill. Here, for example, a water company has begun backfilling this trench with gravel that serves as bedding for the pipe. 
Then the soil excavated from the trench is put back and compacted in loose layers about 150 millimeters thick. Finally, when the backfill reaches about three quarters of a meter from the top of the trench, a specific class of crushed stone is placed and compacted in layers. Then, on top of this material, a temporary patch will be constructed. Non-shrink fill, also called unshrinkable fill and flowable fill, is an alternative to soil backfill. It's a concrete-like mixture, minus the coarse aggregate, and with enough water to make it flow readily. The advantages of non-shrink fill are that it allows for narrower trenches, is placed easily and quickly, easily flows into and fills up hard to reach areas, displaces any standing water, self-consolidates, attains maximum density, doesn't settle, can be dug up, and requires less inspection. Disadvantages include its non-availability at times and in some locations, and the need to protect it during the setup period. Steel plates are probably the best means of protection during setup. Although non-shrink fill may be increasing in use, traditional soil backfill still predominates. And that means that compaction is still a key issue. A variety of equipment is used to consolidate backfill layers. Most often, manually operated gas-powered or pneumatic-powered tampers. But larger, self-propelled equipment may be used where trench size permits. Regardless of the equipment, the backfill should always be placed in layers, or lifts, about 150 millimeters in loose depth. Each lift separately placed and compacted right on up to the top of the subgrade. The goal is to build a dense mass of fill that will not later settle under its own weight or from pavement or traffic loads. Typically, agencies specify that utility cut backfill be compacted to 95% of maximum density, as determined by standard Proctor tests. The only way of knowing for sure that such a requirement has been met is through density testing. By such methods as nuclear gauge, sand cone, or Clegg impact tester. In terms of how they test the actual density, how frequently they test it, or indeed whether they test it or not, agencies vary. More of them should consider density testing. Otherwise, they need to rely on stricter requirements for lift thickness, compaction equipment, and number of passes. Once utility cuts are completely and properly backfilled, the next step in the process is surface restoration. Here and there, utility cuts may be made in streets paved with brick or cobblestone. But most utility cuts are made in pavements of concrete, asphalt, or asphalt over concrete base. The pavements disrupted by utility cuts should generally be replaced with similar materials. But another variable is whether the repair will be permanent or temporary. Many agencies make temporary pavement patches when utility cuts are closed and then later return to permanently patch these locations, for example, during the following spring. Although temporary patches will eventually be replaced, they must still be constructed well enough to not settle or disintegrate during the short run. Cold bituminous mix is typically used for temporary patching, whether in asphalt or concrete pavements. Placing the right amount of mix in separate layers and compacting each layer properly are key steps in making a good temporary patch. Enough mix should be placed and compacted to leave the patch slightly above the level of the surrounding pavement. Traffic will further compact it. Of course, if too much mix is placed, the patch will become a bump. 
and if too little is placed, traffic compaction will form a depression in the road. In making a permanent asphalt patch, the perimeter of the repair area should first be marked beyond the limits of the temporary patch. The perimeter should be rectangular with straight sides, even though the temporary patch may have been irregular in shape. The sides should be either parallel or at right angles to the roadway center line. Then the pavement should be saw cut, both to facilitate removal of the pavement inside the patch perimeter and to help produce straight vertical sides. The patch area should then be broken out. The debris should be removed and the side should be clean, vertical and straight. Now, when the pavement consists of asphalt over a concrete base, the next step is to moisten the subgrade and sides of the patch and then place concrete. But even when the pavement is full depth asphalt, many agencies require a concrete base for their patches. Here, for example, a 200 millimeter thick concrete base is being constructed. Because the permanent patch is larger than the temporary one, and therefore larger than the dimensions of the trench, the concrete base spans the trench area. The rigid slab won't settle even if the trench backfill does. When the lane or lanes must be reopened to traffic, the patch may be protected with a steel plate to allow the concrete to set up and completely cure. Once it's cured, the concrete should be covered with hot mix to form an asphalt cap. The asphalt should have a uniform thickness of at least 50 millimeters. When a full depth asphalt patch is constructed, without a concrete base, it should be at least as thick as the original pavement, or at least 100 millimeters in any case. Also, the mix should be placed and compacted in separate uniform lifts. Mixed temperature requirements should be complied with whether the asphalt patch is full depth or cap only. Proper compaction procedures should likewise be observed in either case. The patch edges should be compacted first. Then the entire patch should be rolled in both directions. The finished patch surface should be smooth and conform to the surrounding pavement surface. No bump, dip, or other noticeable difference in the riding quality. Concrete patches for utility cuts should be made by following the same established procedures used in constructing all concrete patches. With the pavement surface satisfactorily restored, the final task is site cleanup. All work materials and equipment must be removed from the job, and the pavement and adjacent areas should be thoroughly cleaned up. A combination of power equipment and manual work is typically required. Remember, every work site is in someone's neighborhood. A good cleanup job not only makes the area look better, but also makes it safer. Finally, Traffic control signs and other devices should be removed in reverse order to the way they were set up. When work will continue into the next day, open trenches must be safely barricaded to keep vehicles and pedestrians out or covered with steel plates. Traffic control devices that don't apply after hours should be removed or covered. As long as utility facilities are located beneath our roads and streets, government agencies, utility companies, and contractors must do everything possible to ensure that utility cuts are made and repaired correctly and safely, with minimal disruption to traffic, and without leaving behind a defective pavement.